Hello, I hope you all have your coffee or beverage of choice. Join us on this Sunday of May 23rd, 2021. And uh, usually uh, at this time, I have my show with Reverend David William Perry out of London. What is truth? But today, we have a special guest because David had another commitment. And we have my oldest friend and best friend, uh, Dr. Douglas Gabriel of American Intelligence Media, that uh, thoughtful endeavor of, of Douglas and his, his dear wife, Tyla, who's one of the most industrious people I know. In any event, I thought it'd be good if we kind of... Uh, explored some avenues that Douglas and I have been having conversations about off and on for the last 45 years. <laughs> and That's right. It's still, been a long conversation. Still trying to figure it out. And so in, in that regard, it's important to note that, that things can get lost in translation. And as uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe said, Mathematicians are a kind of Frenchman. Whenever you say anything or talk to them, they translate it into their own language, and right away, it is something completely different. And so that's kind of the, the quandary that we all live in, in the pursuit of truth, is there's so much importance that, that should be understood relative to language and the skills of any individual to understand what you're saying, uh, their relationship to, to earth evolution as a whole, as far as to what extent they've made that a conscious endeavor, or it's something that still at this point works in them unconsciously. And so what we're trying to do is help ourselves and others become more conscious of the times in which we live and what the initiatives are that we can help be a part of that which is building a new world rather than attempting to dissolve into some kind of uh, subnatural physical realm as the earth falls away, the physical earth. And so in light of that, I told Douglas that we'd explore uh, some of the concepts that Rudolf Steiner had presented in his Karmic Relations series, or Karmic Relationships. It's an eight-volume series of, of lectures he gave toward the end of his life. And it's important to understand that Rudolf Steiner's personal karma was uh, having to do with bringing the concepts of reincarnation and karma into the Christian stream once again being that it was there in the beginning, as can be seen by the cryptic remarks made by Jesus to the disciples when they inquired about Elijah and they, it was put into a context that, that made it clear that they were talking about John the Baptist, as is that's what he said. And they have done with him what they will. So you see that there's this whole uh, deeper aspect of Christology, of, of coming to a conscious relationship to the Christ impulse that is really the backbone of Rudolf Steiner's work. But he couldn't get to the, the kind of pinnacle uh, of his work in his own personal destiny as, as to the karmic relationships series because he was so busy fulfilling uh, the, what should have been the missions of other individuals that were incapable of rising to the occasion. And so, I mean, you look at that and also helping others in all the various sections of the Anthroposophical Society begin endeavors in art, education, medicine, architecture, uh, dance, theater, sculpture, uh, just music, I mean, there's so many facets to Rudolf Steiner that 
it befuddles the mind, given that starting in his early 50s, he, he gave over 6,700 lectures and he had 50 published works and uh, books and articles. And, and so it's, it's really is a massive body of work. And so Douglas and I and, and our other friends would strive to try and, and take Rudolf Steiner's work and connect different uh, lecture cycles to other lecture cycles in, in an effort to, to try and go deeper with what might be in that idea that there's there's this living idea that that's behind the work of anthroposophy rather than the dead conceptual theoretical uh approach of uh, almost all of modern culture and so in light of that i thought that we could begin to pursue some of these uh topics i don't know how far we're going to get i always put together all kinds of notes and sometimes I never even get to them because the conversation becomes too interesting in another direction. But to start this off, I want to share a story of something that happened to me back in the 1970s. At the time I was living in a, with a nice balcony overlooking Pine Lake up north of Detroit. And it was a, a idyllic existence shall we say and there was a winding road that came around the lake and i'd get in my little bmw 2002 and i loved like driving down there it had rally lights in the back and everything and i, I it was just really a, a, an experience going through all those curves the curvilinear thing is is such a pleasant uh, shape and but as I was coming around from the golf course and I'm approaching this the biggest curve that I'm going to meet on the way to my place, there's this little bird in the middle of the road with a twig in his mouth. And he's like standing there defiantly. Now I, I know that this has happened to many of you that you get a bird in the road, you don't worry about him a whole lot because when have you ever ran over one? I mean, they get out of the way. It's, we don't know how they do it because we can't see under the car, but they somehow manage. I don't know what we'll call ever driving over a bird. But this little fellow was down there and he was being so defiant with that twig in his mouth. It was like he was saying, he's telling me to slow down. So I slowed down to a crawl and I came around that corner and there was maybe a less than two-year-old child sitting in the middle of the street playing with toys and totally absorbed in his toys. <laughs> and I would have driven right over this child, and, but I did not. And I went and, and helped get the child out of the street <laughs> and then went on my way. And so there's this kind of miraculous nature that, that involves coming into uh, the, the relation to the, the cosmic mysteries that has to do with being able to uh, pay attention to nature, that nature is something that they could share with you. And, and likewise, on the inward side, that there's this, this inner certitude that's present as the voice of conscience. And between the two of those, we can work our way through the challenges that life brings and even help bear the burdens of karma for others. And so in light of that, I think that that'll give us a good start. How are you doing there, Douglas? I am doing great, John. Thanks for inviting me onto the show. Now, well, you must have, have, you must have something that, that you could share in light of, of what I just uh, provided. Well, well, my program notes are only eight pages, but so, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I'm ready to go because, you know, the, the concept of uh, addressing truth is so bold that when I saw your first show, I thought, good luck, John. It's, uh, you could go on with this forever because, um, you know, recently I have been focused on truth, but I've always been a seeker of truth. Matter of fact, I have a degree in comparative religions where I spent years searching for truth in all religions, trying to find that golden thread that's common to all of them. 
And uh, in some cases I did, and in other cases it became quite confusing. So even, for instance, preparing for this show, I went online and put in the word, you know, truth, quotations. And this morning I read about 200 quotations or more of all the smartest people all making their remarks about truth. Not a one of them said what truth is. Not a one. So I'm going to read you the reason why that's true. Webster's Dictionary, mm -hmm. Merriam in this case, uh, says that um, truth is a transcendental fundamental or spiritual reality. Ho! Since when does the dictionary state there's anything spiritual? But here, also it states that it's fact. Well, uh, uh, you, you, with numbers, you can make anything, any fact, prove anything. Matter of fact, I have a quote from one of the great geniuses saying that. It also says it's actuality. What is actual? Oh, well, that's only the... Uh, effort of all the philosophers over all of time trying to figure out how do you know anything? Can you know truth? That's the question. And even if you do, doesn't it go through, as you just pointed out, either the reflective process, looking into the outer world, trying to find truth, or looking inside yourself to the perceptive world where you're reading your own percepts about truth, because all truth is going to be relative. Uh, let's go on with this. Uh, what else does good old Webster say? It's fidelity, which is what they used to call truth. Who has fidelity in this age? When was the last time you heard anybody referred to as having fidelity? Now, constancy, well, basically, we probably would never call it that. In this day, we'd call it being stubborn. So if you want to hold to truth, you have to look for a body of truth, as it says here, the body of true statement, a body because as Rudolf Steiner says, there's no such thing as a fact that stands alone. Everything is connected to other things or else it's not a reality. It's just your imagination. And then if you're going to address truth, how long did it take Buddha to realize that Maya was illusion that led to delusion? So sitting under the Bodhi tree, he had to answer to who? The being of delusion, Mara, Maya. And when he finally put his right hand to the ground and said, witness now, Mara, that I am enlightened, that was the moment of enlightenment, is when Buddha understood what was outside of himself and inside of himself, exactly as you pointed out, the two different directions you can go. And so you can, uh, if you're going to go outside, it's a transcendental, fundamental. Okay, so it's a fundamental, we call it scientific theories, but it's transcendental and it's a spiritual reality. So how about if we go to what Socrates said? Socrates said, to know anything, you remember it. You remember it from the world you were in before you came down to birth. I say down. That's, that's, he didn't say that. When you come to birth, you come out of the world of archetypes, the world of uh, the ideal. And anytime you know anything that is truth, it's because you remember it from your prenatal existence. That's what Socrates said. That's what Plato said. And even Aristotle insinuates that, but Aristotle was more caught up in the world. So we can, um, the first thing I'd say to anyone on a path for spiritual truth is the following. In all of the spiritual teachers that I chased all over the world to sit down with, to have a personal conversation with, to ask them my questions, having already gotten a degree, a PhD in comparative religions, I wanted to find out from people practicing it, what reality is truth? Where is truth? Who's truth? What is truth? What's the difference between truth and error? And they, this is what I came down to, because finally, Gaelic Rinpoche, really the teacher of the Dalai Lama and your teacher, my teacher, always said there's relative truth and there's absolute truth. And unless you qualify your question, Douglas, I'm not going to answer it. Do you mean relatively or not? Are you talking about the general or the particular? the relative or the absolute. And until you define that, you're not going to get very far because when you say truth for me, it has nothing to do with settled science. It has nothing to do with facts, with actuality, about the only thing that words can do for you because words are also part of Maya. They're part of delusion, illusion. What words can do for you is show you that there's a duality in the world that you need to overcome. The, what you pointed out from the beginning, the outside and the inside. That's the whole intent of 
of great philosophies like the Upanishads. How do you merge Brahman with Atman, with the, the divine, with the human? And that's what truth does. Truth connects you there. But when I say truth, I don't mean truth in this physical realm. I'm speaking of the being of the hierarchies called the Kyriotides, the beings of wisdom. Because the real truth, if you want absolute truth, goes straight to wisdom. It goes to the beings of the Kyriotides. And that is a mystery which no matter how many broadcasts we would have, we could not get to the end of describing how wisdom, also called Sophia, Shekinah, uh, and on all, many uh, thousands of names, the great goddess, the triple goddess, uh, Magdir Mater, whatever you want to call it, her, Steiner called her uh, in three different fashions. And one of the fashions was he showed us in time that there were three different parts to the earth, Saturn, sun, and moon. And if you take all three of them together, that creates the great goddess, the triple goddess. But that's truth. So when we talk about truth, Rudolf Steiner, the greatest truth teller I know, and I put together uh, 70 Steiner quotes about um, him stating what truth is because so many people dance around the question of what truth is. They'll tell you what error is or all these amazingly clever remarks about truth, basically showing that they're rather upset with truth because as they chase after it, if they get it, it's a painful reality. It's something that you might not even want. But error in our modern age, I just wrote three articles. One of them was on the karma of untruthfulness, taking Rudolf Steiner's quotes from that cycle of lectures, karma of untruthfulness, and showing how error happened. And hopefully we'll talk today about the way that um, the war in heaven with Michael was going on and fell to the earth in the 1840s. And by 1879, Michael came to be the regent of our times, the archai, the time spirit. He was raised up from the archangel to the archai status, and he is the countenance of Christ. And so we are at the time when cosmic wisdom, which Michael rules, which is a sun wisdom, because Michael is from the sun, just as Christ worked through all seven of the beings of the Elohim, the being of wisdom worked through all of the beings of the Kyriotides to bring down to earth what was the mystery of Golgotha. And so what we're talking about is wisdom that literally there aren't any words to describe unless you have a cosmology, what wisdom really is. So all of the religions are chasing after wisdom. Any true religion that I know, certainly any traditional religion, chases after wisdom. That is the goal. And the most beautiful things, as a matter of fact, my wife wrote a book called The Gospel of Sophia, a three-volume book talking about who this being of wisdom is, who this being of truth is. But when it comes down to truth, oh my goodness. I just want to read a couple of the quotes that I came across this morning to show you how really sad these people are. Uh, how about this one? George Canning said, I can prove anything by statistics except the truth. That's what I was just saying. Math proves anything you want it to prove. Facts prove anything you want. Scientific theory, settled science, proves whatever you want. But 100 years later, they will laugh at that, saying that that settled science was a pathetic mythology that was uh, basically disinformation and very uninformed. I li also like what Henry David Thoreau says because he is so smart. He gives it as three things because the human being is threefold. So he says, rather than love, than money, then fame, give me truth. Well, that's why he lived alone in a shack on Walden Pond, okay? Because uh, give rather than love, he'd have truth. Uh, you know, so you can take any statement anybody makes about truth unless they understand the truth came from the prenatal world, from the belief basically then in reincarnation, from the belief that there are divine beings in an archetypal world that create what then later falls down to earth as its shadow, as the fallen light, as the fall of Lucifer, as color, as the suffering of light coming into the earth as deeds and suffering. Truth comes with suffering. And if these people didn't suffer enough, they didn't get truth. And they certainly didn't meet Lady Wisdom. How about this one? This is, this is our age. James Garfield says, the truth will set you free, but first it will make you miserable. Absolutely true. All the uh, I've been working on Fatima as a fourth article connected to truth, untruthfulness, 
materialism. Materialism is evil in using the gospel of St. John as a way to initiate yourself, to come to truth, to perfect your heart so it can be a vessel that can hear words and understand whether they're true simply out of your own self. That's reality. But you aren't going to get there unless you uh, first you found truth and it makes you miserable. Now, how about this one? Iris Murdoch, okay? These people think they said these some, some of these things for the first time, and that's what I found. Oh, half of the quotes you're going to find are plagiarized from other people because people don't know what to say about truth, especially in our uh, age of post-truth, falsehood politics, basically where everyone lies. It's all propaganda. If it's on the mainstream media, just look for the opposite because that's probably the truth, or at least in the direction of truth. But he says, or Iris says, Murdoch, uh, we live in a fantasy world, a world of illusion. The great task of life is to find reality. In other words, find truth. Yes, yes, and guess what? You're not going to find it in the world. So you can take every one of these great people and all the great things they ever said and find that it is nothing but dust. It is just ash. But if you go to Rudolf Steiner and those quotes that I Put together which uh, later there'll be a URL connected to our site and uh, Betsy my incredible wife Tyla said, who John always makes that remark about her I just want to underscore that saying she's five uh, people in one body and she does so much work uh, she's going to give us what I caught entitled Rudolf Steiner on truth 70 quotes of Steiner every one of them goes further than anything you can find that anybody else ever said about truth what did Christ say? He said he came to witness to the truth. And what was the truth that he then referred to? This kingdom is not my father's kingdom. This kingdom is not mine. Who's the, whose is it then? When we're trying to go outside into the reflective consciousness to see if we can find eternal wisdom in the processes of nature, well, what are we going to find? We're going to find duality. You're going to find a yes and a no. You're going to find the relative and the absolute. You're going to find that what you find out there as a discovery is what you think is truth. You better hang on to uh, only for a minute because it's relative. It's not going to be truth later down the line. So what we have as the striving for truth is the thing that excites me uh, as uh, right up there with love. And uh, I'm so honored today to get a chance to talk about this. And if um, you want to hear more about what Rudolf Steiner says, because in almost all of my articles, well, most of them, I'm quoting Rudolf Steiner as my justification uh, uh, to authenticate what it is that I give as my opinion, because <laughs> Steiner's the last quote I have here for you is what I'll end on my little diatribe here on truth. And that's a Steiner quote that goes as follows. <laughs> because why? He is full of truth. And any one of these, we could give an entire broadcast on. But the 70th truth of Steiner on this page says, what we call truths are simply the more agreeable errors. This is something we must clearly understand. So if we are going to think we're talking about truth in this world, it's probably based at least partially on error and partial truths can be as bad as evil itself. Well, so we've opened up Pandora's box then by attempting to pry into the secrets of nature. And this brings to mind, for me, you know, Rudolf Steiner had also said that, that wisdom is the fruit of suffering. And so when you look at that and, you, and you'd say, in, in world history, who perhaps has suffered to the greatest extent? And for me, the archetype of, of that quietude of suffering is the, the image of, of the Mother Mary, Sophia, Mary Sophia, at the cross on Golgotha, watching the crucifixion of her son. And so you have that that image that's, that's kind of burned into earth evolution. When you have 
Christ who says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. And that he's saying that, and it's not a metaphor. And he's not just being poetic. He's telling you, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so if, if we enter into that, and, and we look at the first 14 verses of the Gospel of John, where he, St. John clearly lays out the, the kind of image of the mystery of Golgotha in 14 very concisely stated lines. And so that, for me, has been a personal meditation for many years. But you see, a few weeks ago, I gave a, a meditation that Rudolf Steiner had given to the esoteric section. And in there, he gave a threefold meditation on cosmic thinking, cosmic feeling, and cosmic willing. And the first part is the wisdom lives in the light. So you see that there's this connection between wisdom and light. And that the light, if you look at it, the light supernal, not just the, the, the light of nature, but the, the, the primal light that, that proceeds from the realm of the spirits of form of, of the Exusiae and, and is the, the portal to the upper realms of the spiritual world because the Steiner had indicated that the Exusiae or spirits of form, which would be like Jehovah Elohim of the Old Testament, they are the highest spiritual beings that can enter into and react directly with the world in which we live. Whereas Christ being the leader of the sun spirits and Harkening back to the old sun evolution, the, the, the mystery of number and the mystery of the primal etheric, so that you see that leader of the sun spirits entering into Jesus of Nazareth at the baptism and dwelling in the human body for a little more than three years, that this is a central event in human history never to be repeated. And Rudolf Steiner is very adamant about it. And so when we get back into this, wisdom lives in the light. He says, there's no uh, thing in the realm of the senses that's going to give you this idea. So that what it does is it builds a bridge to the super sensible. And he said, this meditation can lead you to experience the life before birth to which Douglas has been referring in the context of, of Socrates and Plato, that, that all knowledge is remembrance, is basically the Platonic or Neoplatonic framing of that idea. And in Rudolf Steiner indicates how in the ancient world, people didn't feel that they the, their ideas originated from them, but that it was something that was visited upon them from the spiritual world. And it's only in modern time that we think that, that our thought process is something that's entirely internal. And because of our more materialistic relationship to our being. But when you get into the second stage of this, where he gets into the cosmic feeling realm, and he says it brings it down to the throat chakra, which is the, the 16 petal lotus that ties into the eightfold path of the Buddha in the sense in that its wisdom radiates in the light. And he says, this meditation can bring you to an experience of your earlier incarnations. And so again, it's the wisdom radiates in the light. So then you see that there's this connection, that, there, that there's these two aspects because there's the light itself and then the wisdom that is is being born, you see, like what Douglas is referring to in reference to the curiosities and that whole process of the spirits of wisdom. So that when we get to the third stage where he says you bring it down to the heart and he says you, you meditate on the actual motive force of the blood itself, 
which was received back in, in old sun evolution from the, from the dunamis, the spirits of, of movement as, it, as its prototypal activity. And then you see that what this does, he says, and, and you can think of this because when you, when you blush, for example, because uh, you're embarrassed or when you kind of go cold, you see that, that that feeling that you get within that variation that's what he's referring to because that's the working of the, the will in the blood that, that's a part of your the key to understanding what a human being is, is that the human ego dwells in the warmth of the blood and that the, the will processes themselves that work in us unconsciously at this stage in our evolution, that the wisdom of the world radiates in the light. So you see that this connects us to the whole destiny of Earth evolution, of which Earth, as I've said many times, is the fourth stage, it's the human stage, with the mystery of birth and death, preceded by old Saturn, old Sun, and old Moon. And so in this process of, of, of evolution of consciousness, we are able to participate in the evolution of the Earth itself. And this is something that's gone through a transition since the turning point of time at the mystery of Golgotha. But now we've reached a real culmination, whereas in 1879, we have moved from the age of Gabriel of ancestral ties, secret organizations, tribal associations, nation beings, and that whole form of destiny of which the divine spiritual beings were actively working with at that time. But to be in service of all that over much is to be out of touch with the times. Since we've entered into the, the archangelic period of Michael, the archangel Michael, the archangel of the sun, whereas Gabriel was the archangel of the moon, like for example, he announced the birth of John the Baptist. Well, that's the annunciation process of birth. He's directly connected to that mystery, the birth mysteries and ancestral ties and all of that. But that Rudolf Steiner said that to understand time, you have to go back to the, the late Stone Age to uh, find the concepts that are embraced by Zarathustra, the great master of, the, of that time period to where he said that that uh, in i paraphrase because i didn't bring up the quote but that that evil is something that in another time could be good and so you see that there's by being out of step with what's the wholesome intention of the divine spiritual powers that's how we can proceed into creating uh, what our, our friend David Spangler would call misplaced concreteness. You know, like I said last week, you know, a breathing is a great thing. Taking a deep breath can be a very good thing, but not if you're sitting at the bottom of a lake. See, so you have to know what time it is and where you are. There was a profound mystery you're addressing. And since you're there, I'm going to stay there for a minute. People um, don't quite understand why the Archangel Michael is directly related to the being of Sophia, who is the being of wisdom. Well, in the, there's ancient Saturn, sun, and moon, as you've mentioned, and ancient sun, the Kyriotides worked with the archangels at that time to put wisdom into light. The very thing that you were pointing out is one of the great esoteric lessons that Rudolf Steiner refers to again and again. If you can see that in light, there is wisdom, and this means physically. This isn't a theoretical uh, thing. This is reality. In light, the light from the sun is more than even anyone can understand. There's warmth, light, sound, and life, and that's just beginning to touch it. There's other. There's akashic ether. There's and two other ethers that we have yet to understand. So if you think you can exhaust the meditation on just that one phrase, wisdom weaves in light, you are mistaken. And that shows that in this physical world, you can be completely overwhelmed 
by the error that you find in the outer world. And the more that you think that you have found, you have to be very, very careful. Like uh, George Washington says, um, truth will ultimately prevail where there are pains to bring it to light. If you want truth, if you want initiation, if you want wisdom, if you want to see the face of wisdom, you're going to have to walk across a bed of coals. You have to go down to the river and drown yourself. You're going to have to cross the threshold and uh, meet all of your fear, doubt, and hatred. And then once you have, usually wisdom herself comes and takes you by the hand and leads you across along with Christ on one side, Sophia on the other. They lead you across the threshold to see into the spiritual world. Well, most of the things we call settled science are about invisible forces, the forces of gravity, the weak and great force, the force of uh, the light of the sun. The sun is invisible. The only reason we see it is because we see it through an atmosphere. So when you talk about wisdom, there is no end to it. And so Michael is considered to be the son of Sophia. And right now, because Michael with cosmic wisdom was in heaven. And where did Michael teach? Out of the female, very feminine, son initiation center, or we're just trying to refer to it with many different names, but the Mother Lodge, he calls it. The Mother Lodge of Humanity is where Michael was teaching up until the time of 1840 when Michael came down to the earth and brought cosmic intelligence. Now, where was cosmic intelligence before? It wasn't personalized. It only started in the 8th, uh, 7th and 8th century that human beings could really take on what it is that Christ brought, which is the I am, the individualized free human being that could act out of love without compulsion, without duty. That only started to happen at the time that we call the, the quest for the Holy Grail. As a matter of fact, in some cases, people call Dionysus the Areopagite's book that was translated and brought into Europe, which John can address much better than I, the divine names, that that was the Holy Grail because it awoke the mind to the fact that there are divine beings that interpenetrate us that we can work with that we call forces, settled science, and we have all these theories about them. But our theories are no better than the mythology of the past that described the beings that were behind these forces. And now we are trying to take over what is basically called intelligent design. Because look, even Marian Webster says the truth is a spiritual reality. So there, what the scientists now say is there's intelligent design, but we're not going to give it any beingness. We're going to recognize that this force is organized. We're going to recognize that without this force, we have no life. But it's kind of like Einstein's theories. You see, the scientists don't tell you the most important details. For instance, with Einstein's theory of light, which of course we know is not true because now just two days ago, uh, they released information about plasma that they're able to um, exceed the speed of light in lasers. They can go a hundred times the speed of light in lasers. That's been true and around for 20 years. But now it comes out that plasma too, this very substance, not just laser light, but that a substance can in fact move faster than the speed of light well, that what they don't tell you about Einstein is the following. Einstein presumes the uh, luminiferous ether. All of his theories are based upon an ether that science up until recently said didn't exist. Matter of fact, they poo-pooed it and they said that all the ancient wisdom about warmth ether, light ether, sound ether, which is also called number ether or uh, many other names for it, and then life ether, and also there's these negative sub-earthly forces that take those ethers. And then there's the super-earthly forces that take those ethers higher and lower. There's always a continuum and everything is in relationship to all other things if it's true. For instance, if you think you ever met an angel, did that angel connect you to other angels? Did you ever have an inspiration that didn't connect you to other inspirations? Did you ever have an intuition 
that didn't have incredible ramifications in the outer world that basically led you to other intuitions. So if we want to be smart, we go to the one guy who we, John and I, have been trying to prove with many other people, anything Steiner ever said that was not truth. So if you go to him, he's going to tell you simply this, truth is found in the physical body. Hardly anyone in our modern age would ever say that, but they believe that because they're materialists and they believe their physical body and the outside physical world is all that there is. So truth is found in the physical body. Beauty is found in the body of life that builds up that physical body. Goodness is found in the body called the astral body or the body of desires. If you're good, if you're kind, if you do the right thing, as, as Dalai Lama says, his entire teaching can be filtered down into one phrase, be kind. That's all you have to do. And instead of finding truth, many people say, oh, all you have to do is get rid of the error in your life, and that will keep you so busy, and it will advance you so quickly in spiritual development. Who cares whether you find the truth? Because as Rudolf Steiner says, we settle for the most agreeable errors that we call in today's world, settled science. But if you look closely, you're not going to find the truth there because the truth in all cases, and this is the key point here, the most, the most key point, and it's inherent in what I've said so far, especially from Gaelic Rinpoche, there's the relative truth and the absolute truth. Well, what is the absolute truth? It's the divine or the spiritual or the perfect or whatever you want to call it, the ideal, the archetypal. And what is the relative? That's us. That's our perspective of truth. That is what we perceive in our physical body, the source of truth. Truth, which is also where wisdom is. Tremendous wisdom is there in our physical body. It's a temple of wisdom if we just simply study it. And our consciousness is part of that, of course, as well as all the physical aspects. So what Gaelic Rinpoche said, and the Tibetans say, relative and absolute truth is the same thing as saying, if your soul, and we're in the consciousness soul era, which awakens the spiritual self, but it's also called the spiritual soul. So if you're awakening the third and highest part of your soul, the consciousness soul, the spirit, spirit soul, you are trying to connect to the spirit. Well, that is what anthroposophists do all the time. And as you said, in the reading material you told me to go over before I came here for this talk with you, this conversation, is the ninth lecture of the karmic relationships. And he says this, and I want to ask your question because this is going to open up a real can of worms. Matter of fact, there's two parts here. And the first part is in the first paragraph and the second part's in the second paragraph. And I want to hear what you have to say about it because there is a huge debate and a battle. And I didn't know why you chose this particular lecture, except now that you want to refer to Michael. And yes, that's in here. And it's very, very critical we must know who the Archangel Michael is. He's our time spirit. He's the archive of our time. Now, this, I want to give an apology, a good old scholastic apology beforehand. If it says men, it means humanity. So take out, don't let the feminine old language get you confused. And when it says anthroposophical movement or anthroposophist, those are simply the people who are uh, the followers of Rudolf Steiner, we could say in a way. Two quotes for you, John, because I know in the old days, going to John's house always meant that he would magically pull down a book, open it to the exact page of what it is we're talking about and read me a passage that always made me feel great comfort to know that the spiritual world will keep giving you that wisdom that you have worked for, that you've, as Washington says, that you've given the pains to have, or that others say, you know, will make your life miserable when you find the truth. Well, that's what we're going to address here in the second paragraph, first paragraph. I have said that those who stand with full intensity within the anthroposophical movement will return at the end of the century, and others will unite with them. For by this means, the salvation of the earth, the salvation of the earth and earthly civilization from destruction must eventually be settled. I just want to stop for there for a second. He's saying the anthroposophists can unite both the types of anthroposophists there are and basically be the salvation of the earth and stop the destruction of civilization. 
He says it right here. That's who's supposed to do this, okay? That's a big injunction. This is the mission of the anthroposophical movement, which weighs on the one hand so heavily upon one's heart, while on the other hand, it moves the heart, uplifts it with enthusiasm. This mission we must understand and see. Second paragraph. It is most necessary for the anthroposophist to know that in this situation, as an anthroposophist, his karma will be harder to experience than it is for other men. From the very off outset, those who come into anthroposophical society are predestined to a harder, more difficult experience of karma than other men. Now, he goes on to address illness and all these other things. And you see anthroposophists who look at other anthroposophists and say, oh, you're ill. You must be something's wrong with you. You know, you're evil or whatever. Or they say the culmination hasn't happened. John, is the culmination happened? Not going to happen and what about these anthroposophists having to suffer so much? Well, that brings up an interesting point, and because of some of the recent challenges, uh, it became increasingly relevant to me in light of things that you've gone through and others I know. And, and keeping in mind, uh, always reverting to what is the fundamental intent of the divine spiritual powers what are they what are they trying to accomplish through mankind on a level of, of inspiration what is this spiritual inspiration we're supposed to be giving well again it goes back elsewhere rudolf steiner talks about how during the the three to four hundred year period of the archangel gabriel that he worked into the actual structure of the brain of mankind in preparation for the archangelic period of Michael, which was to follow, and that there was a uh, capability, a, an actual organ established in the convolutions of the brain. And he said, were you to examine in an autopsy a brain of somebody from the 12th century to a modern individual, you'd see the variation actually physically. And so he, he goes on to say that this is an organ uh, that, that's meant to build a bridge uh, to the divine spiritual powers. And that if mankind doesn't take up the task of building the bridge, you know, finding that that approach, like in, in Goethe's fairy tale of the beautiful lily and the green snake. And it could be approached artistically, it could be approached musically, but to be able to take your strivings and focus them in such a way so that you contextualize them within the intentions of the divine spiritual powers. It's, it's, it's very clear. You know, saying grace at your meals, having gratitude for her circumstances that arise in one's life. Because see, in, in moving away from the safe haven of Gabriel with the, the associations with our family and groups and, and all of that, to move towards the individuation that's implied through Michael is a great challenge and can leave one more vulnerable because you don't have the kind of uh, support system that has existed for so long, you see. And so in, in developing this, you can, you can go through a period to where you feel disconnected, you feel disenfranchised. It's as if you're, you're alone in this world until one can, can bring in that, the, the third aspect of it that, and that heart force, that you take this heart force and, the, and you strive to connect the head and the heart, uh, the grail with the round table, that that's the actual bridge that's occurring on, on the esoteric development level. And, and that will bring you the warmth of speech and enable you to, to participate in alleviating the sufferings of others. And it's through that striving to be able to participate of your own free will rather than as a compulsion from some kind of outside regulation, but as something free, that you're, you're severing 
uh, the relationship even to family. So you see that many times family are the people that maybe you can't relate to as much as you can your friends. It's it's happening all around. You see that, and and Jesus said, "I I, br I bring a sword to suffer, sever the father from the son, the mother from the father." The you know it's, it's chopping it up because it's it's coming to. Uh, being an individuated being, that's the challenge. But in that, it can also be an acceleration if you're of the Michael school to clear up karma. So a lot of times you see people that are actively pursuing this have tremendous burdens that they end up bearing in terms of health and so forth. And and you go, well, what's, it's like Job, like, why are you picking on me? You know, but it's, it's, to get that stuff out of the way, to, to pay off past uh, reparations of karma. Because remember, Rudolf Steiner also said that Christ is the new Lord of karma and that he's actually entered into earth evolution. He left its spirit man on the region of the sun, his life spirits in the atmosphere of the earth itself, and that he's here and he said, I shall be with you always. So true, so true, and and you know that it underscores the fact that in the conscious of soul era, we uh, Rustana characterizes it by saying that we are um, we we tend to be helpless, hopeless, homeless, overwhelmed by forces outside of ourselves that we can't control, and that's actually what is necessary. It's what evil is there for us to run up against, so that we wake up and can see the difference. As I always say, and so few people ever do because they haven't had the experience, all the people who have had two apparitions, they see hell before they see heaven. That's just the way that it is. As a matter of fact, any I can tell you if an apparition is true by telling you first, asking the question first, did they talk about the fires of hell and what happens and why they got there? I mean, look at the Gospel of St. John I mean, excuse me, the book of Revelation, St. John, where he talks to the churches and he dresses them down and tells them what's wrong with them. Actually, he's talking about himself. But anyway, the point is, if you don't go through your own body and work these things through as moral qualities, as values, as virtues, and add them to these forces that we would call, you can call them nerve ganglia with modern science, you can call them chakras, you can call them whatever you want. But these places in your body are literally there for you to develop. And your head represents the whole cosmos. And the cosmos is 12-fold. So until you can see any particular thing from 12 points of view, you don't have the full perspective. And Rudolf Steiner gives us even world philosophies that are part of those 12 views. We call them the zodiac. If you can understand all the zodiacal influences that create the 12 different types of influences coming to us from the cosmos, which you know we would call astrology, but science would call astronomy, then you don't have the full picture. You're not truly a being in the cosmos. And the 12 world views are also aided by the 12 senses. And so we think that we see truth with the five senses. Well, there's seven others that we ignore. Rudolf Steiner gives great detail. I give them in my uh, articles that I've made reference to. And uh, these senses are senses that they still can't see the eternal as it's manifesting in the physical world because of the world's duality, but they can see the shadow that is cast by the spirit world. And, and that is seen through duality. And when you can see through duality, then you can start possibly with your view of all 12 perspectives. And usually I like to say 24 perspectives in reference to the book of Revelation, but also because there's always a male and female of everything. So I would say there's actually 24 perspectives you have to have as you look at any one thing, Rudolf Steiner says 12. And these are moods in your soul not of talking and of a point of view or an opinion or a specific, specific way to approach the truth. It's how you listen. So if when you hear the truth, you can hear it ring with the proper timbre, the proper tone and quality and virtue, 
and it sounds in all 12 chambers, then you have the truth. But that truth is, again, going to be relative or it's going to be absolute. So I just also want to go back to the fact that in our modern age, we are so fighting untruthfulness that Rudolf Steiner says a tremendous amount about untruthfulness, and I put it in the article on the untruthfulness of karma, that lecture series, and the article I just wrote. But I want to read some of these Steiner quotes that I brought today because this is the way that modern man has to look at truth. Unfortunately, Steiner says that the modern human being, who I call uh, secular humanists, because if you believe in science, that's just another belief, folks. That's just another religion run by men in most cases, like the past religions of the past 4,000 years. And by the way, we ended the Kali Yuga, the Dark Age, in 1900. In uh, 17, uh, 1879, we entered the age of Michael. And in 1415, we entered the age that we're in where the consciousness soul can be developed. So we're only one third of the way through the consciousness soul who, by the way, the image Rudolf Steiner gives for the three souls are the three Marys under the cross. Mary Magdalene, Mary, and the mother of Jesus. And the mother of Jesus represents the consciousness soul. And as you said, she's the perfect example for suffering. And that's why she's a perfect example to relate to the modern person. But Rudolf Steiner, as a person who wrote in The Karma of Untruthfulness, one of the greatest exposés on how untruthfulness led to World War I, and then he predicted World War II because of that untruthfulness, and he predicted everything that we're in in our modern age. He was one of the greatest prophets of our times. Uh, and of course, he died in 1925. He says, untruthfulness has everywhere become a quality of the age. It is impossible to describe truth as a characteristic of our times. Doesn't even exist in our times. The moment truthfulness asserts itself, the supersensible experiences fade away without being understood. In other words, untruthfulness kills the relationship to the spiritual world and thus creating materialism, which by a horrible cyclical process in darkens the spiritual world closest to humanity, the realm of the etheric. And that is the realm that Christ is now active in. And those who are awakened can see Christ in the etheric, even as the second coming. But those who are materialists makes Christ and all of his believers suffer again by darkening the world that's supposed to be bringing us light and life and the wisdom that we use to the light. So untruthfulness and error is the watchword of our age. And discernment is the tool that we need because now, if you don't have discernment for your food, for your water, for your air, for the vaccines or anything you inject in your body for medical uh, procedures, it could kill you. Let me repeat that. Without discernment, you may die. So you better learn discernment. You better get yourself morally pure enough that your heart starts to ring for you what the truth is. And you don't have to look outside of yourself to a priest, a guru, or anybody else for it. Now, Steiner, as I said, and I'm going to prove it right now, and then that's about all I have to say. It, it, well, <laughs> I, John's laughing. He knows that's not the truth. <laughs> I guess we all just live with error, don't we? So anyway, I'm going to read some of these Steiner quotes because why? He's the best at it, okay? He says, the love of truth is the only love that sets the ego free and stops self-seeking. I read 200 quotes on the truth. Nobody, he has three profound things in that one st statement that no one else even gets close to. He says, an inward cultivation of truth is essential for the progress of the soul. It's the key. If you're a seeker, if you're on the seeking for the Holy Grail, if you don't have, a, if you don't cultivate basically what I'm talking about, inward ability to hear and understand truth, then you're not going to spiritually advance, period. Each person must set out to grasp truth and to kindle in himself a genuine sense of truth. But we cannot speak of a single all-embracing truth. That's why we have so many religions. They all think they have a piece of the truth because they took one passage and they believe that more than another passage. And in here somewhere he says partial truth is worse than evil <laughs> it, it, because it makes you think you have something at least to what I talk about a lot, and Rudolf Steiner actually first coined the phrase spiritual materialism, 
I'll read one more because there's 70 of them and it goes on like this all day long because every one of these is what if you have a consciousness. Now, you can get to heaven by just being pure, but you have to be really, really, really pure. But if you have a consciousness, you have to go this path. There's no other way up the mountain back to where you came from. So he says, truth is best served when the seeker leaves himself out of the reckoning. <laughs> That's one of my favorite. So again, I want to thank you, John, because who wants to sit and talk about truth? And then when they do, who has anything that is actually both relative and absolute? Yeah. I mean, again... I only try here to serve up riddles to keep people active in, in, in their own process. Like it says in, in the grail where it's, it, it begins with lady adventure. And she says, I want to enter into your heart. I just, you know, I just need this small place where I can enter into your heart, you know, so that that, and it's that spirit of the quest. That's something that I pursue for 640 pages in my book. As Douglas knows, as he's, he wrote the foreword to my first book. But in Matthew 6.22, uh, Jesus says, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. And so we know wisdom lives in the light. And so by allowing this process to, to take place within you, that, that that's a beginning of a journey on, on a path of wisdom. And you see the, the two basic uh, aspects of it. Rudolf Steiner makes mention of an individual he calls Hermes that most people might call Menes, but the founder of Egyptian civilization, the Pharaonic civilization. And then you have Moses, who came out of the city of An, the city of the sun, and led the Israelites at the aegis of Jehovah, the moon god. So you have this sun-moon uh, image going on there. So that he says that with Hermes are entrusted the mysteries of space. On the other hand, in Moses are entrusted the mysteries of time. And so you have this whole idea of space and time as being a context whereby this drama of human unfoldment can take place. But yet elsewhere, Rudolf Steiner says, well, space and time is, a, is an illusion. And he says in science, they, they create equations, you know, with space and time to calculate velocity. And he says, the, the reality is the velocity, that the, the space and the time are those things which are the illusion. You see, so you have this world of appearances that we deal with here. And so it's good to be able to invest yourself in your own development and begin to trust yourself and have courage because courage is the heart force and the, the great courage that's expressed in the gospel of Mark, which is the gospel of the lion, the gospel of Leo. And what do you see there? You see Christ healing. He's bringing healing forces to the world. And he says, you know, in greater things shall you do, you know. And so you see that it's about bringing oneself to the point to where one has the courage to be able to actively attempt to serve the divine spiritual powers as it moves forward. And so that's, that's kind of what we've been struggling with for the last 45 years or so and uh, with measured success. But uh, I, I didn't want to get so far into this that I didn't share with you uh, some more of, of 
Dr. Gabriel's Wisdom, and he has a couple books you can get on Amazon. There's the Eternal Curriculum to Wisdom Children, uh, Intuitive Learning and the Etheric Body, and that's available on, uh, on Amazon, and I have the link below on both YouTube and on Facebook. And his, another book of his, because he has a lot of works he can do. And you can go to American Intelligence Free and get free PDFs of all kinds of stuff. But his other volume is The Eternal Ethers, A Theory of Everything. And that's on Amazon, and the link is available there. And then I also have uh, my books. My first book is The Arcana of the Grail Angel. Those of you that have been here a while will know. The Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which proceeded from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templars and the true Rosicrucian Order. And it has a foreword by Douglas Gabriel, and it has extensive diagrams that are also included with further additional diagrams uh, in my second book, and uh, so that we have this cosmic wisdom, this twelvefold and sevenfold, that that is the Grail diagrams that I worked on for so many years to be able to try and and have something, a trestle board, so to speak, to be able to embody the great wisdom. Of, of the initiates that have been bequeathed to us through the efforts of Rudolf Steiner and the masters in the West, the master Zarathustra and Christian Rosenkreuz, Schizianos, and also wisdom from other great initiates so that we can find a way of processing this great wisdom that's been bequeathed to us. And it's, I find for myself at this stage, it's through being able to connect uh, scripture and connect the lecture cycles of Rudolf Steiner and questions that arise in one lecture cycle, you find that are answered in another. It's continually the case. And as I say, it's so often the case that I go, aha, I, th I figured it out until I finally get to a, another lecture that Rudolf Steiner gave at a different time of the year, in a different year, and I realized that I was 180 degrees off course. <laughs> so that it's it's no simple task, as anthroposophy is the most difficult study that I know of. And Rudolf Steiner also made the point, so it's a pretty fair assessment that it's not an easy path, but my books were meant to provide uh, kind of a, a tool to help unlock the secrets of the, the archangelic periods and all the larger cosmic cycles and all of that that are discussed so often on this Sunday show. And likewise, uh, some of this is covered in Douglas's books and many of his works are available uh, on his site and uh, on Amazon where you can download things for free. So it's, it's a great gift that he's given to humanity being that he is Werner Gloss, who is the, the, the leader of Waldorf education in America, referred to Douglas as his right hand, so that you have somebody who's done it. He's been there, he, he's done the work, he, he's read the book, he's got the t-shirt. So he's he truly does have uh, more credentials than anybody I know in certain areas of this. Me, I've merely done my humble efforts uh, at the Bayflower Bookshop is the manager of the largest metaphysical bookstore in the world. And after I left, Douglas took over my place. And then I went on and created relational databases of one of the larger private esoteric libraries. I created a, a computerized relational database of subjects and then went on and created uh, a similar uh, architecture for uh, Egyptology and Mesopotamian studies of some 15,000 volumes or so in, in a relational research database so that we have a background and we see that we've been struggling with this. So I think we've suffered uh, enough for the time being at least. 
And uh, I think that in light of that, if, if you're interested in, in helping my ongoing research, you can go to paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888 and perhaps buy me a cup of coffee or something of that ilk. But uh, I really appreciate our audience we have here. It's a, it's a humble audience and that's okay because I believe in, in quality. Like we're, we're only looking for a few people that can at least attempt to wrestle with what we're saying. We don't even, I'm not even concerned if they disagree with me or not, at least if they're thinking and they're struggling with it. Isn't that right, Duncan? Absolutely. And uh, one would be hard pressed to find a book that has more truth in it than yours. The Arcana of the Grail Angel, literally, literally, I do not know a book that has more truth and wisdom in it. And that's because you had access to every single rare book that there was in the whole world and uh, for a long time. And you had uh, the, the desire to suffer through studying all that stuff. And very rare in today's age because you see the culmination of the Anthroposophical Society is about what they called Platonists and Aristotelians both coming into incarnation at the same time. We're in an Aristotelian time, very science oriented, very materialistic, very outward oriented, very what Steiner calls reflective. That you, he says you don't really completely enter into perception. Any perception comes in and then you reflect upon it. That's, I wanna make that very clear. If you could enter into perception completely and see it as it manifested, you'd see the spiritual manifesting in the physical world. But that's what Buddha did when he had Mara testify that Buddha could see through the material world and see its true inherent nature. So the culmination has happened, and the Platonists are more the artists. The Aristotelians more the scientists. They're here now, and we have to work together because only together can we create the new archetypes, the new icons, the new light motifs that can lead us into a new age. We have left the dark age of Kali Yuga, we're in the light age of Satya Yuga. We're in the age of Michael when cosmic wisdom is available to us everywhere. All you have to do is just, you don't even have to get the books anymore. You simply go to your computer and you do a query and you can find out all the wisdom, but all the knowledge, but can you turn it into wisdom? That's the big question. Now, I made a statement earlier that I was done, but actually that was an error because I forgot. See, there's a thousand reasons for not telling the truth. But I have a poem I'd like to share with you. And this poem is a distillation of an attempt to do what Novalis did. Novalis wrote a thing called the Novices of Sias. So if you go to Egypt, John can tell you this in great detail, but there's an inscription that says, uh, I am Isis, I am the past, the present, and the future. No man has lifted my veil and lived. Rudolf Steiner says we have to have a new Isis, basically, the threefold Sophia that is described in the Gospel of Sophia. And he says that the new injunction is, I am Isis Sophia, I am the past, the present, and the future. All men must lift my veil to live. And change the word all men to all humans. So what he's saying is, no longer is nature hidden to us. We have gone over the threshold to penetrate into nature and to start to rob her to rip her off, to use her beauty as power, to use her truth as distilled dead facts of entropy. And so I wrote a poem because as Novalis was a great poet, and as Goethe says, and Steiner says in poetry, you can bend what John was just describing, time and space. And the velocity of your intelligence and consciousness in a poem can go from ancient times to modern times in a sentence. So I'm going to read you this poem to end what I have to offer today. And um, it was written a long time ago, and, and John's a poet. And as a matter of fact, we have a book on poetry called The Goddess Meditations. I believe it is still out there on Amazon. Goddess Meditations, 365 wisdom sayings. And John gave many of those. And this was in it, and this is broken up into two wisdom sayings. And the reason it's being quoted is because what's truth and what's poetry? Navala says that poetry is one of the few places that you can tell the truth. So I'm going to try to tell the truth for you right now. Truth and poetry bespeak one source, you see, for nature speaks in all that she can be. The windward rush, 
the crashing sea, the northern lights, a redwood tree, all call the ever-changing name of thee. The oracles at Delphi, by vaporous tongues unsealed, the poems of Homer and Hesiod, the nature of gods revealed, the wind of Dodona sounding the oaks so tall, like druid magic circles speaking nature's call. These are voices still there for us all. Merlin is still with us, watching from his home, under the stone of Bardsey by Namu cast alone, not dead nor too old and tired to speak, just enchanted, limited, and growing weak. And Arthur lives too, sleeping in Avalon, until the time is needed a kingdom to be won. From Brosiolanda news of fairy quest came. Was Merlin wrong to trick and send them on these games? Do we conquer nature or seek her for some fame? Do we forge her beauty or try her might to tame? Can't we listen? The surge is deep and strong, for without nature, you cannot live for long. Christian Rosenkreutz listened and made a book called M, the open book of nature, your higher self within. Alchemy tends the fire so true as time measures the moments due and gives to each its process and kind as we manifest the will sublime in us, about us, around us, and through nature's ubiquitous harmony speaks to us too. Then listen, then dance, then sing joyful strains to build the future's hope and extinguish all our pains. Well, amen. I mean, that was a litany worthy of a prayer. And so it's these kinds of uh, outpourings of creativity that can help us make this journey uh, more fulfilling. It's, it's that f that's the fruit of suffering is creativity. And see, that's, that's what you can translate into being because it's about becoming uh, responsible as what, what is going to be a, a representation of, of that you were actually here at all? Is it, what have you created? Have you, have, you, have you done anything creative? Have you created a, uh, any architecture, any art, or, or anything like that? So that these things, there's something eternal about the whole idea of art. And so that, that is a beautiful thing. Rudolf Steiner said about the, the Last Supper, he said, if beings came here from another planet and they were able to see the Last Supper by da Vinci, that they would understand. I mean, what does that mean, right? So that there's something very powerful, which you could see in like the, the Madonna of, of Raphael and in the music uh, of Wagner's Parsifal or Beethoven's symphonies or Mozart or any, any one of them or in the works of Shakespeare. So there's this, this creative human spirit and, and it doesn't mean that you're going to compete with any of those, but that you're just participating in your own way, in your own uh, little area of the universe because you're adding to the creative goodness in the world, see? And, and that's what needs to be understood is it's that there's no effort too small to be a part of that great tapestry. And that's, that's the, the, the process of the logos itself unfolding, is that, that the word coming into being is an actual creative process. That is the, the sixth mystery. And so we are given the opportunity to be able to cooperate with the divine spiritual beings as a creative process. And so that's a, that's a beautiful sharing. Thank you. But uh, I, I forgot to mention, as frequently the case, is I guess my motivations are not ambitious enough, but uh, if you're interested in my books, you can get them. You can contact me through my uh, academia page that I have listed below. 
and especially if you're outside the United States, uh, you can contact me personally through there or private message on Facebook, and I can make arrangements to get books to you. I've sent them all over the world. And uh, with, I assume with Amazon, a similar type of arrangement could be made with, with Douglas's uh, works. And so uh, in light of all that, uh, we have a few minutes left. And I think that in entering into our conversation here, it is, leaves a lot of soft, unanswered questions. But that's a good thing. That's, we're not trying to answer the questions. We're trying to improve our questions because we see that the, the work of, of the logos of the world is an unfinished process. So that it's not this static, like you see people today say, this is the end times, this is it, you know. We're there, you know. And, uh, well, we are there, but we're, it's an ongoing drama that, that, that doesn't cease to continue in, in understanding what is implied when, when St. Paul says, ye shall be as the angels. Well, if we still have a few more minutes, I, I have nothing else to say uh, except error. <laughs> but uh, it's just an amazing uh, topic, and I can see why you've discussed it, and it's been been your banner and the head, uh, or the, at least the uh, direction you were pointing, because truth is unending. You can take any one of these sayings, as I said, 70 of them, and any one of them you could dwell on all day long. Now, um, I think it's kind of shocking that as we look around, we might be looking for these spiritual people. Where are they? Where is this culmination that Rudolf Steiner talked about? Where are these uh, Platonists who have come to help the Aristotelians? And it is right now in our age, we are in so many um, assaults from so many different directions that to stand with the truth is so difficult that people don't read books. So we keep referring to books. Uh, I know people who have said that they've never read a book and they never will, and that's just the way that it is. They need to be entertained. And so the churches have been, uh, in fact, replaced by what was malls and now is just online shopping. And education has been replaced by entertainment, and now it's just political program propaganda entertainment. And basically this striving for truth has been thrown out the window because as Richard Steiner says, people run from truth. They don't want truth because truth would make you wake up and waking up from your dream or your hypnosis can be very, very, very difficult, very painful as a matter of fact, and can make you go a bit crazy. So in this world, just realize the number one thing you need is discernment. And what is it that you need to discern anything? Your human heart, that's it. The human heart is the chamber the uh, secret chamber, the holy chamber, the heart of hearts. It's where you can take truth, any truth, whether it's someone speaking, whether it's something you're reading, any truth, anything you want to know if it's truth, sound it in your heart and take that into your sleep for three days. And I guarantee you that your heart will give an answer. And that's the kind of thing that people don't understand. If we are truly connected to this divine world, to what it is that makes our solar system act the way that it does. And of course, scientific theories have been proven totally incorrect. The sun does not move in the fashion that they thought it did until just within the last few years, they've shown the real direction and the real movement of the sun and the planets. And it looks like DNA as we move towards uh, Vegas in, this, in the sky, the sun is spiraling, pulling the planets behind it and creating what looks exactly like DNA. Well, what is this harmony that we're listening to? It's the harmony of 7.43, often called the Schumann wave, the reaction between the Earth and the atmosphere, which changes depending on whether you go north towards the poles or south towards the poles. But in the human heart, what is the frequency of the human heart? 7.43. So the human heart, when it is in perfect resonance, is not only... Of course, a three-dimensional hologram of the universe, but it is also the place where truth resides. As Rudolf Steiner says, truth is in the physical human body. And though we may think that it's imperfect, 
It is exactly what it's supposed to be at this time. And it's John pointed out, each of us, our consciousness can change the world homeopathically. One person in history, if you go down through history and you really look at the biographies in history, you will find that literally history was changed repeatedly hundreds and hundreds of times by one single person. And they changed the history of the whole world. So it's on all of us to do whatever art we do, the art of living, any art that you do, but do it honestly, do it striving for the truth and knowing that relatively, you may not be able to get it like my poem. You know, some would say it, it it's terrible and others uh, would say it's okay. But the reality is it's an error. And the truth is in the absolute, it's in the divine, it's in the spiritual. And it's when my heart for me connects to my spirit that is the only true eternal to truth that you're going to find. And then, of course, you can add the other eternal things, as John had pointed out, love, mercy, grace, compassion, all the other verities, all the other virtues, all the other uh, beautiful divine qualities. Those are all in the human heart. They're not in your head. So get out of your head, get into your heart, and listen for the truth, and it absolutely will speak to you. Amen. Well, I guess that serves us as a prayer to consecrate our endeavors today. And yes, taking the the secret of of the sevenfold heart mystery and using that to bathe the twelvefold head mystery, and it creates this lemnus gate, which is really uh, the key to understanding the present age. Just as my friend Yuri, the, the anthroposophic doctor from Russia, reminded me the other day is that the, in coming out of the past of the cosmos of wisdom, it was a spiral, yes? And you can see that in all the plant forms, it's a spiral growth. He says, but the path into the future is the lemnus gate, and that there, there's this uh, motif of interplay that's so important in understanding our movement to future evolution and that there's this lemnus gate aspect to the motion of our solar system that's that's the real mystery that Rudolf Steiner had pointed towards in his astronomy course so you see that you have this whole spiraling interplay that that is is a lemnus gate and that we're oh there's Tyla I want you following. to know that he I, is married and he is on a schedule and I have to get him now. Yeah. It, but here's yeah, the other yeah, deal. That's why I'm signing off. This is the other deal. The, the, <laughs> you can't talk about truth without wisdom. This is my being of wisdom. And she's the one who always keeps me straight. And she's the one who says, no, that's really a stupid uh, error you're making. And without that, I wouldn't be here today. And that's a fact. So we love to do things together because we believe that we're in the age that men and women should be on the podium together. There should always be two people, man and a woman. And uh, she's the author of the Gospel of Sophia. It, uh, John may have the book with the most truth in it, but if you want the truth that is the, uh, the most apropos to your heart today, it is the Gospel of Sophia. So thank you, Tyla, for coming over and saying hi. John, just like Socrates' wife would uh, yell at him for not doing the dishes, I got to go. Well, yeah, yeah, it's good to see you. And, and they asked Soc Socrates' wife broke into the into the the group that they were talking, and she started yelling at Socrates, and then she leaves the room. And they said, "How can you deal with that?" And he, and he says, "Oh, but when I go into the woods, it's so quiet." <laughs> That's true. He also said one that you always quoted before. Uh, he uh, says, "How how can you put up with her?" And he said, "Are you kidding? She's the antidote to you." <laughs> Well, no, you're, you're thinking of Abraham Lincoln there. They, he was speaking, to, I think, the, the French diplomat. Oh. And, and his wife burst in, and she's smoking a, like a pipe, and she's yelling at him about some domestic state of affairs. And, and the Frenchman says after she leaves, Monsieur, how can you deal with that? And he says, it's dealing with her that prepares me for dealing with people like you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So anyway, the spirit of mirth. Is, is an important power. And Douglas, I can't thank you enough. Oh, it's my pleasure, John. Anytime, it's, it's been great 
do, working with you over these, what's it been, 40, 50 years? It's so, been so long. Anyway, hail to the truth. All hail. <laughs>